we all have something, a, a certain moment that happens. So when you achieve this success and think that's the ultimate happiness, no, there it could have been something a grandfather said or a teacher or a friend watching your family struggle, watching a mother and father that suffered from alcoholism or drug addiction. That stuff goes somewhere. And to keep it inside, when you can get to that, and it's like that bomb just explodes out of you. It's the greatest sense of relief. One would probably think, man, this guy has it all. And yet, tell us about Bottom. Like, what was really going on? You know, so I started at 14, uh, my drug addiction. This was by complete accident. I was in sleepaway camp. I had bad stomach pains. The nurse gave me this green liquid in a cloth syrup cup. I drank it. And having a lot of insecurities and adequacies, feeling of less than, being told I had a severe learning disability, being verbally teased by other classmates and um, you know, not speaking up about it. I, I think I took that with me. So when that green liquid went into me, um, the stomach pain went right away. But five minutes later, as I'm walking across the softball field with the counselor, this incredible feeling came over to me, this warmth where I felt like Superman. All those feelings went away. And I got back to the bunk from the cool guy, the pop, poplar on the buff one. And, you know, I'm flirting with the girls next to the bunk. Everybody's laughing with me, not at me. And I'm not thinking anything of it. I go to bed that night and wake up the next day, do all my activities. And that next night I'm lying in the bunk bed with no stomach pain, but I'm obsessing at 14 on that feeling. So I learned how to lie and con in that moment. And I heal over, the counter comes running over. I said, man, my stomach's killing me. We've got to go back. And I did that for three straight weeks until mom and dad came up for visitation day and found that I was taking liquid Demerol. And um, a few months later, I'm at a dentist appointment, got my wisdom teeth removed. And uh, one in three teens, which is why I love speaking to high school kids. It's my favorite group um, that goes to a dentist appointment now and get prescription opiates become addicts. I was one of the three. And that same feeling came back from these two white pills that she gave me. And I had no idea what they were, but same sort of thing. Within three days, I was out of the pills. I knew I had a free pass to stay home from school and go downstairs, I put on the crocodile tears, I grab my cheek, I tell my mom, I think I have a bad infection, we have to go back to the dentist. And as I always say, as a loving mother who wants to see their child suffer, right? And she took me back and I lied and conned and got in the three days of those pills that I found that were extra strength Vicodin. And um, now I had money, a lot of money for my baseball card business, unheard of amount of money for, for the mid 1980s, more money than my friend's parents were could even fathom. Right. And, and you were, and you were like 16... Gained. You were like 16 years old for, in the mid-80s. Yeah, 14, 15, 16 years old. Yeah, always 50, 60,000 in cash. And I saved, but be ready to buy cards, you know, first one to buy a car. Um, you know, I, I just, um, you know, I just timed it so perfectly to the point where I was the only one to have a cell phone in my town. Back then it was called Bell Atlantic. It was $3 a minute. It was in a battery case with a leather um, anten rubber antenna with a leather case around it. And um, I remember my dad would go nuts when he saw some of the bills because it was $3 a minute in between class. I'm getting phone calls from stockbrokers, lawyers, doctors, corporate business owners, executives, because I would advertise in the Bible of the industry and they would tell me, hey, I'm looking for a Mickey Mantle rookie. Or I'm looking for this. And that weekend, I'd be at my shows buying, selling, trading, and I'd have my list of what people needed. Now, remember, there's no cell phone but uh but but uh you know photos back then so mm -hmm. it, it was amazing i would i would almost kind of have to get a real photo printed and then either mail them the photo or i would have to fax it to them from the photo to make sure they liked the card and then the deal the transaction would be made so i partied like a rock star though you know i fully enjoyed it i bought a lot of friends that i thought were real friends i wanted to take everybody with me along for the ride and um for six or seven years it worked and at 21 it all hit brick wall i got arrested four times in six months and all for possession charges not for distribution for personal use because i was the life of the party I, I needed the friendships i needed people to like me i needed people to accept me i needed you know around town and you know around the country for people to realize that darren prince arrived but you know a lot of that was looking for an outside fix that was really an inside job and i chased that feeling from sleepaway camp for 24 years you know at the end after an overdose after not wanting to live anymore um 24 you know years of of hell i think at one point it did work uh in the agent life i was you know fully hooked on oxycontins vicodins and percocets but then at a certain point something that was 
using, I would say using to live, uh, living to use turned out to using to live. And I don't know when that happened, but those pills now became my kryptonite and I couldn't function anymore. And now I was taking them just so I wasn't opiate sick or dope sick or going to withdrawal. And mm -hmm. but mentally from the neck up, I was shot. And July 1st is when the magic and God came into my life in a way in the form of a woman, Andrea, that was dating my uncle at the time. And they were visiting my mom from Miami in New Jersey, paid me a surprise visit. Never met her before. I was just so sick and tired and broken. And she walked into my condo and said, am I okay? And I said, no. And she asked me what was wrong. And I told her everything, completely honest, you know, transparent, not holding anything back. And she said, do you realize you're an addict and your life's unmanageable? Do you realize you're powerless? And now you have a disease. And I said, yeah, she goes, most importantly, I'm going to ask you to realize that it doesn't matter if you're Park Avenue or Park Bench or you're out of jail, that the disease of addiction does not discriminate. And that broke my soul. I started to cry. And um, she goes, you wouldn't do anything it takes. I said, absolutely. And she put me on a 36-hour detox plan, which was July 2nd, 2008. I came back from the gym. I'm miserable, nauseous, throwing up, all the wonderful things that come along with detoxing. And I called them up and I said, I can't do this. I'm calling the goddamn doctor to get what I really need to get. And they said, this is a disease talking. My uncle grabbed the phone. It's time you kick the crap out of it. Put your damn ego aside and get yourself to a 12-step meeting and tell these people you're sick and you're suffering. You need help. And I hung up the phone. I said, no freaking way. I've been to those dumb meetings when I was 21. They don't work. And now I lock myself in the bathroom. My wife is step. My damn wife is hysterically crying banging on the door, don't do it, baby, don't do it. Um, I don't know if she thought I was going to try to take my own life or what was going on because um, we cleaned out all the medicine cabinets of the opiate. So as I'm shaking to get some non-narcotic anxiety pills to help with the cravings, out come to extra scent Vicodin, which again was bizarre because we knew that we got rid of all the opiates. So where did these come from? And for a split second, it was like a gift from God. It was exactly what I needed. But then the miracle happened. I um. I fell on my knees. I called out to God with everything in my fiber, my soul, my core. I said, I can't do this anymore. I need your help. Take the money, the notoriety, the business. I need a single day of freedom. And um, I had a white light moment at the Carillon building in New York City because I stood up and I flushed the pills. And as I stood up, I heard the voice that got you and you're ready. And this burning hot sensation came across my right shoulder. And I go onto the computer in the living room. I found a 12-step meeting on a beautiful summer night. There was no Uber. And I'm looking up at the sky in the back of a taxi cab saying, oh, my God, for the first time in my life, I wanted to get sober more than I wanted to get high. And uh, I walk into a church basement with 150, 200 addicts. They were all once a hopeless state of mind. I heard the leader say, is there anybody new coming back or sick and suffering? And this hand went right up. And it wasn't me. And I said, I'm sick, I'm suffering, I'm suicidal. I've got all the outside stuff, but it doesn't mean anything because I don't mean anything. And that surrender, that gift of desperation gave me the power of choice back in my life. And one day at a time went to a week, to a month, and then to a year. And what I felt in that moment at that meeting was a love and a support and a connection that I never had before in my life. A dozen spiritual brothers and sisters came over to me and told me so many incredible things. It's easier to stay sober than it is to get sober again. Let us love you before you even know how to love yourself. Uh, this is an ego-crushing fellowship. And when my hand went up, that's when I realized the agent life, the super agent job that everybody says or calls me, that didn't mean anything. You know, this is what matters. And um, I realized that my ego needed to stay crushed. And then the real gift of it is giving the gift away. And once I hit that one year and I realized I slowly had this foundation, I transformed my life one day at a time through the 12 steps and the five A's that I call them, attitude, adjustment, action, accountability, and acceptance. And those five A's could be used in work, any transformation you're looking for in your life, your relationships, your health, your career. I just happened to use them for recovery because I knew it was life and death and no matter what, I join that club, then no matter what club, then no matter what happens in my life, it's never an excuse to pick up a substance. And um, 
you know, and I've been through hell and back in recovery. I tell people all the time, man, you know, I lost Muhammad Ali, Joe Frazier, lost my dad, but none of it was an excuse to go back to that life because you get this beautiful um, perspective and perception change that uh, we could deal with life on life's terms. And uh, I tell people that are suffering, mental health, whatever it might be, easiest thing to do is be of service. You know, man, I know you do a lot of it. And when you give out yourself so freely, unconditionally, without expecting anything in return, that's what we get out of our own head. And for me, those esteemable acts have given me the self-esteem I was looking for my whole life. Never came from Ali or Frazier, never came from Magic Johnson. Came from doing the work of myself and showing other people that hope and recovery exists and you don't need to be suffering. What a powerful story. I, I was literally like, tell, I was like fighting not to get emotional, man. That's, I mean, that's- I was gonna I, tell you, they'll probably the last 15, 20, I've done every single person gets teary eyed. Yeah. Like, it's just because it's an energy that works through me every single time because I know your audience is listening. And, and, and yeah, you can be impressed on what I've accomplished professionally. But first and foremost, I'm a degenerate drug addict, man, that was beaten to my freaking knees. And by the grace of God, I came out of it one day at a time and he rose me to my feet. And I told him in the bathroom, that night, if you take me out of hell, I'll spend one day at a time taking others with me. And nothing comes before this. Nothing. So, and this was 2008, you said? It's 13 years? 2008, yep. I'm coming up on, God willing, 13 years in about five weeks. You know, it's one day you know, at a time. I, I, I hear you tell that story and, you know, I'm, I, I think I'm, I'm fortunate my, in from a chemistry perspective that drugs and alcohol have never been my thing. I mean, I've taken painkillers and then I stopped and it didn't, it didn't, you know, I was obviously, but you obviously know enough people that have struggled with it. Oh my gosh. And yeah. That, and, 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 but I'll tell you what I struggle with is food and, and food is, an, is a, it. it's a nefarious yeah, that, bastard because you can't not eat. No, <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 but you look like you're in great shape. It, because that's my walk. That's my struggle. <laughs> you see my struggle. It's it's the same as you, man. Like I'm a teetotaler with food because I know if I give an inch, I'll backslide a mile and I'll wake up in the ditch. Um, you know, I used oh, to luckily, be. I I get it, man. Everybody's got something. Uh, you know, I, was... I can't just. I just can't have four Oreo cookies or like a couple yeah. pieces of candy. It's still the isms are still always in my brain. And, um, you know, I got to watch with gambling over eating yeah, I mean, too much sugar. I work not a, six days a week, you know? Some people will see this on, the, on YouTube, and I'll show you this picture. Oh, wow. That's me. Wow. That's me with about 60 or 70 more pounds of fat than I carry wow. right now. Um, so you got to watch it. I, yeah, you got to watch it, it. As I'm hearing your story, it's, it's so, you, you, oh, you just hit me in a good way, when you're like, just all this stuff and none of it matters. That's nope. not what matters. And we spend, it's so interesting because chronologically, if you map our life or, you know, we have 24 hours a day, we sleep for what, you know, five to eight, let's yep. say we were, you know, we have 16 with which to decide what to do. The vast majority of us will spend the vast majority of that time chasing stuff that by, by what you just described, doesn't actually really matter. Exactly. And yet we exactly. have to, to, we have to, to survive and we have to pay our bills, but no, I, 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 and man, I had all this stuff, you know, I had a $175,000 Acura NSX at 21 years old and <laughs> living in a beautiful condo and just never made me happy. And, and oh, Omar, the rock star and Jay Shetty, but I did their podcast uh, recently, the, the, the very near and dear spiritual brothers to me. And I say this, honestly, the God's honest truth, if I lost the money in Prince Market Group tomorrow, I'd be okay. Because I work my ass off to find myself. Huh. And when you find yourself in here and in here and in here, and you get that peace and freedom and happiness, I would just look back and say, man, God, thank you. What a run we had. What's yeah. next? It would just break my heart that the nine people that worked with me and my mom and sister would probably have to struggle because, you know, and hopefully they wouldn't, hopefully 
Prince Marketing Group and Darren Prince gave them experience and an opportunity from that resume to find something incredible for them to move on to and evolve and find the success that makes them happy. But um, it, it's just, so I move into a little studio instead of a big penthouse and yeah. live in a Marina Del Rey on Tuesday into a gorgeous building. I don't need the stuff anymore, man. I wear sweatpants every day. Uh, used to have the fifty sixty thousand dollar Rolexes. Holly Saunders is a client of mine. She bought me one for my birthday, uh, just because she goes, "You need a Rolex." I'm like, I, "I can't do it. it." Doesn't that stuff doesn't? She goes, "Well, I'm buying you one then for your birthday." So she bought me a beautiful Rolex. I, I don't doesn't you know, especially in a city like this where people are driving rental car Ferraris and Lamborghinis and living in rented mansions in Beverly Hills or Malibu. And they want the whole world to think it's their home and their car. And uh, it doesn't, that, 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 that's, that, that to me, that, you know, that's not what life's about. Be you, be real, you know, you know, I don't, I don't need to keep up with the Joneses. I just need to look in the mirror and that I'm happy the person that I am, you know, cause I used to be that guy, you know, I used to be that person. I wanted everybody to think. Um, but I'm still, you know, there was times I struggled financially too. And, uh, you know, I didn't know how I was going to pay the credit card bill, but I was always wearing the beautiful Rolex or whatever it might've been in my twenties. And everybody thought I had it all. And I had tax problems and some business debt and, um, you know, not, that's not, it's not a good way to live. I'd rather just let it all out there and just tell people that, you know, <laughs> this is me and that I work my ass off and I continue to work my ass off every single day. And it's more important that high school kids understand this because everybody's so in awe of social media and what they see and the new trends and not going to make you happy. The money will buy temporary happiness. And I can tell you that because you understand you're very successful as well, but it doesn't buy per per permanent happiness. It gives you the ability to take care of people, gives you freedom. And yeah, it's been nice. I went to Arizona this week and I took a you know, girl to Hawaii, a girlfriend uh, a, a few weeks ago for five, six days. But yeah, it's, it's nice. But I've been there, done that. I've been to Hawaii 20 times. You know, I'd, I'd rather wake up every morning with a sense of peace, and calmness and happiness and freedom and just know I'm doing God's work. Yeah, I was going to say, so where does that, where does that sense of peace come from or maybe a different way to ask it is okay so that that stuff doesn't matter what really does matter what matters to me is lighting somebody else up because i know we're going to save a life and touch a life on this interview i can guarantee it once it goes up on youtube and once you guys promote it somebody that's in a dark place right now that just listens for some words of motivation and inspiration and says holy shit I can identify with that guy Darren Prince just said. I've been there. I might not have had that success, or maybe I have. Um, but I need to do something about it. And uh, if they reach out to me, you know, I always give out my Instagram at agent underscore DP. We send out free hard copy books of aiming high on a certain people who are struggling right now with the economy. We take care of postage, everything. Um, that's it, man. Because my Aiming High Foundation, I was at Oaks Recovery about three months ago. They had me come out there. I gave them a, a big scholarship to bring in four or five people that couldn't afford treatment. And you ask where it comes from. When I was done speaking, these four men came over to me. And uh, one guy just looked at me and said, thank you. It's about a group of 400 people. I got a standing ovation at the end. And, you know, I just, for me, it's, that's not an ego thing. That means that it meant something. It, it registered to them. And I thought he was talking about my speech. I'm like, you liked it? He goes, look, the speech was amazing. I'm thanking you for another reason. Because three weeks ago, I was found dead on the side of the road on Massachusetts Turnpike. I overdosed on heroin. It's my second overdose in six months. And the judge said to go into prison for six months. The prosecutor fought it, convinced the judge to put me into a treatment center. But the facility outside of Boston, the state run facility was booked. They called over here to South Carolina to Oaks Recovery that said, you have called at the perfect time. The Aiming High Foundation just sent us a grant. We could put him on the plane tonight or first thing in the morning and get him 30 to 60 days of treatment. And with that, he holds up his phone and says, because of you, Darren Prince and your foundation, these two beautiful girls, my seven-year-old and my five-year-old, they're going to have a sober dad for the first time. 
and they're gonna have a future. It's better than the biggest business I've ever done in my life. Hey, sorry for the interruption. I just wanted to let you know you can get a free copy of my book, The Millionaire Shortcut, which will show you the fastest way to become a millionaire in the new economy. And there's a special link just for this episode in the description. So thanks for tuning in, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the episode. Now you got me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know. No, I get it, dude. There are the get chairs. It. I got you. Welcome. <laughs> I get it, man. I'm because still again every time, you know, it's like because I'm telling you, and this is not. I'm. I, this is just. I don't know. This isn't in the script. I'm just going to share. It. Like, <laughs> I'm starting to achieve a level of success that is so hollow unless you find ways to channel it into meaning. That's the bottom line. In the last three years, I've scaled a business that I don't even know what the fuck to do with it anymore. It's so big. Yeah. I'm like watching this thing and it's not done. And I'm like, who the hell am I? Right. And, and how and why? And why isn't this, why am I not all the way happy? I'm somewhat happy because I worked hard and it's validating, but why am I not all the way happy? And it's like, because this is only half the equation. The other half is, okay, great, Jeff. Here's some success. Here's some money. Here's some opportunity. Now it's on you. Yep. You don't have excuses anymore. What are you going to do for other people? What are you going to do to create yep. light in this world? Because if you don't, you're worse because you're successful. Exactly. And that's why yep. what you just said just hits me like, like, like it now that's the beautiful thing about money is it gives you more power to do things that matter, but right. it doesn't mean that you've been doing things that matter. No. Not at all. I spoke to Jerry West uh, over the weekend and most revered figures in the history of the NBA. And, you know, he made a comment about that. He goes, you know, sometimes, you know, when so many people are up your butt for money and I'm as generous as anybody, you almost think down back to the time when you didn't have it, how simple things were, you know what I'm saying? And how you really know where you stand with certain people, you know, and I, and I understand that. And, um, you know, but most of it, Jeff, you know, I do a lot more work than working with people in recovery. You know, I've, my own therapist, I still speak to once every few months. But for me, it was neuro linguistic programming, NLP, that basically took me to a different level. My boy, John Alfino, uh, who studied under the same Yoda that uh, Tony Robbins did in Florida to get into that inner child, to trap into whatever anxiety issues, level of trauma, um, any moments that just happened like that, that got stuck in my core and my soul that I needed to get put into a subconscious trance to get taken out. And uh, my ex fiance Priscilla, who I love to death, uh, she's studying now, she's a, a life coach and she's almost at that level, she's doing amazing. And uh, she's the one that explained to me when we were together what NLP does because you know, we all have that inner child, man. We all have something, a, a certain moment that happens. So when you achieve this success and you think that's the ultimate happiness, no, there, it could have been something a grandfather said or a teacher or a friend or a loved one, mom, dad, sister, brother, past relationship issues, watching your family struggle, watching a mother and father that suffered from alcoholism or drug addiction um, or a sister, brother, or I know friends that have lost friends in high school from overdoses, you know, that stuff goes somewhere. It goes somewhere to, you know, and, and to keep it inside. And Joel Olstein's a very dear friend, Joel and Victoria, I'm going to see him mm -hmm. next Sunday at Lakewood. And I love him for his spiritual messages. Um, I got to be in Houston, but he always talks about it. When you can get to that, when you can get to that, and it's like that bomb just explodes out of you. It's the greatest sense of relief, you know, you can get. And um, like I said, I, I got to do so much more than working with other people, but I got in touch with that inner child. I got in touch with, you know, those issues that cause relationship problems, emotional detachment with women. I'm not, a, I'm not perfect, even though, cause I'm sober. My ex fiance will tell you that, you know, I, I, I have to be very careful with the isms. Like I said, it could be gambling. I, I, I stay away from that now. It could be overeating with the sugar. Um, right now I'm with a woman which is a smarter, healthier way for me to be. Because I know Darren Prince, when he gets out there, that addict mentality, yeah. one is too many and 10 is not enough. And so I got to watch with every aspect of my life because it's not an alignment living that life with who God wants me to be.
man, that such a such a timely such a timely conversation. Y'all, you know, I'll go ahead and share with the with the audience. They they wouldn't know this, but this is the second time we've spoken in the last couple of weeks because we we I interviewed you maybe two weeks ago and we had an audio problem and the whole the whole interview was unusable and we had to redo it, which you were gracious enough to give us another about uh, you know another segment of your time which i really appreciate i i kind of feel like i think maybe we were supposed to redo this conversation and ha- i i i tell you my girl was here last night and there was something that happened and she's much younger than me and she's just it was this i call them gmcs these god managed coincidences and she's come to a lot of my speeches and you know hulk hogan told me a month ago when we had you know, dinner down in Clearwater Beach because, brother, I've been telling you since that day that you surrendered, that you got that light around you. You've been anointed, and there's a reason every single thing happens in your life. And um, you came to God and asked for the blessing. And he said, because you came to me correct, I'm going to make you a blessing to everybody that comes in your life. So cool, man. I love, I just have to say, I love Hulk Hogan. He's... Yep. Such a such a and, 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 and yeah, and Terry Balea, who what's his real name, is right. an amazing individual. It's an amazing yeah. individual that was there. Him and Magic were there for me at my worst and never gave up on me. And and to see them just beaming with like pride and happiness and you know, having nothing to do with the business because anybody can make them money. But to know yeah. that I found from my pain my purpose, but uh it's just unexplainable. Your job is the job that like if you went if you went if you plucked out a hundred kids and we're like okay what do you want to do i'm sure we'd hear a few ask like i want to be an astronaut i want to be like a rock star but i gotta think top three or four would be like i want to be an agent i want to i want to work with famous successful people and be around all this this glitz and glamour and i'm sure if they were talking to you you would tell them that it's not all glitz and glamour and there's more to it than that. And maybe some of it is even stuff to be wary of, but uh, I, I think let's start by like, how the hell did you pull that off, man? How'd you land that gig? <laughs> good question. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I mean, I think from, from outsiders looking, it's definitely a dream job and I've, I've, you know, we're not complaining, but it's work at the end of the day too. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely something we all love to do and we're passionate about. And I think if you're passionate about something, you never have to work a day in your life, but it still comes with certain dramas and you got to deal with the, the big personalities and their personal issues. So I started in the baseball card industry at 14 years old in 1984. I started a business, uh, long before the boom that they have now and uh, going on because the sport car market's on fire. And by the time I was 16, I was traveling around the country doing trade shows. And uh, I accumulated a collection of 14 that was worth thousands and thousands of dollars from trading my friends and buying their collections when they were more into dating and partying. And that didn't mean anything to me. And uh, the business just blew up. By the time I was 16, I was probably making you know, quarter of a million, $300,000 a year. And eventually sold the company in 1989 at 19 for over a million dollars. I then went into sports and celebrity um, autograph signings. And I went right up to the biggest name I could through a mutual friend, uh, Harlan Warner, who's a dear friend and mentor. He was Muhammad Ali's agent. And he taught me about the business and what type of product to get and how to sell it and where to sell it. And we were pretty creative. We started some strategic alliances with some big corporations that a partner with partnership with the MGM Graham where we would set up merch in the lobby uh, during some of the biggest championship fights and that business eventually you know blew up and in 1994 95 I got out of it and because of that though I was booking autograph signings for Chevy Chase, Magic Johnson, Pamela Anderson, Smoking Joe Frazier, Muhammad Ali so now I had these relationships and my dad always told me that life is about who you know not what you know so when I had the vision to become an agent um he's like you don't need to go to law school because who are you talking about you've got joe montana this one that one and i started with magic i started right at the top had an incredible conversation with them and uh we were in michigan yeah we were in michigan and i went into his hotel suite they asked me what my next move was and i sat down like a nervous 24 year old kid and i had the courage to tell him 
my palms were sweating and I was like, I want to start an agency. I think I could do it. I think I could work on the big stuff, the licensing, the endorsements, the intellectual properties, the commercials, the, um, you know, book deals, speaking engagements. And he goes, well, you need yourself a big client, boy. He goes, who do you think you're going to start it with? And now I got really nervous and I was like, well, I'd love to have you. And he's like, look, you're very near and dear to me after only a couple of years. I know you're a good dude. I know how hard you work and I love your family. And I'm going to give you one shot for two years. But if you don't use me to knock down every door in those two years, I'm going to fire you before that time is up because life is about not how successful I become. It's how successful I make you and everybody else around me that it's a domino effect. And I just ran with it at that point and you know, just started a- a- adding other cultural iconic figures, uh, you know, Dennis Robin, Evil Knievel, um, you know, Ric Flair. Uh, Scotty Pippen, Mickey Rourke. Uh, there were so many. Charlie Sheen, and uh, we haven't slowed down since. Thank God, man. You know. Wow. So you were twenty-four. I mean, that wasn't a metaphor. You were literally twenty-four when you're sitting there talking to Magic Johnson. Yes. Okay. Yep. And how old was he? Or where? Where was he in his career? Well, oh, so if it was 20, he, he, it's interesting because he was already done with his final comeback with the Lakers and it was a couple of years after the HIV announcement. He wasn't the mega successful Magic Johnson he is today. So we even laughed about it. I saw him a month ago before I, I took a little trip uh, to, to uh, a little mini vacation. I went to see him up in Beverly Hills and we were laughing. He goes, no, it's funny because he looked back and I think a lot of us needed those opportunities back then. And, you know, now we have the blessing and the privilege to turn down multi-million dollar deals if it doesn't make sense for the brand. And uh, I've been able to pivot and understand and, you know, uh, adjust with not just me, but my, my team of agents as well, because it is frustrating as an agent, we only get paid when deals get done. And yeah. a lot of things we have to understand don't fit in his wheelhouse. They might not have the mission and the message that his brand represents. And uh, it's not just with him, Hulk Hogan, the same thing. I mean, Charlie Sheen, you know, all these men and women that represent have been incredibly successful at monetizing their brand, protecting their brand, not oversaturating their brands. And you have to understand that they're gonna say no probably more times than yes, but when they say yes, it makes it all worth it. So, yeah, it is. I mean, brand management is so interesting. And as, I mean, I'll say this, as somebody who is starting to have a brand. I mean, everything I've done in the up to let's say the last 12, maybe 24 months was like, I made some money, but none of it would have been like, oh, that's Jeff Lerner. He's got a, there's a brand. Like I'm starting to understand what you even mean when you say that really. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's so true. It's so qualitative. It's such a long game. It's such a big, it's almost like, It's almost like being like the joint chiefs of staff. I mean, you're thinking strategy at that level. Like, like how are we going to handle relations with North Korea 10 years from now? Mm -hmm. It's that same type of thinking only about yourself. Yep. Right. It's, it's, it's incredibly interesting to me. So I'm, I'm super intrigued by this. Um, Well, you mentioned North, you mentioned North Korea. (laughs) Yeah. Did, Did I get, did I touch close to the Dennis Rodman home for you there? Well, yeah, you know, I orchestrated every tri- I orchestrated every trip, including the first one with Vice. Me and my boy Chris Bobolo, he did the heavy lifting. He would go out there. He would meet with all the dignitaries. There's a couple of them in New York City, and um, you know, it's a special time. Unfortunately, uh, on one of the trips, Dennis let the drink and get the best of them, but but it, but it was really amazing that they both went out to Singapore and even got a call from uh, the press press secretary uh, Sarah Saunders uh, thanking them on behalf of President Trump for being such a you know, influential, uh, you know, component to, to how that historic meeting happened. So it was bittersweet at one point, but it ended on a positive note. Wow. That, I, I, that's so weird. Even as I said it, I wasn't connecting the dots. Wait, Dennis Rodman, North Korea, there's a story there. Um, man, that's, I mean, talk about stuff that matters though. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, that, that's the cool thing about, I'm, I'm veering off from what my original question was, but that's so, what's so cool, I think, to me about working with people that have this much brand capital is it's, I mean, okay, yeah, yeah. They, make a, they make a funny TV show, but that's not, that's not all you can do with a brand like that. I mean, you, exactly. can, you can use that capital to change the world. Yeah, I mean, the two things I've noticed, because I experienced it too with my book, 
um, that give you the most power are being best-selling authors and having a voice. And uh, most of the celebrities have become best-selling authors, but their voice is, you know, it's incredible. You know, the power they have, the influence that they have, if they use it correctly. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, okay. You're, you're touching nerves for me around, around best-selling author because I'm working on a book and there's a whole conversation there. But this is a, story, this is a show, your show, not my show. So I'm not going to go there. Um, <laughs> So, okay, uh, gosh. So Magic Johnson, I rem- I actually remember the HIV announcement. I was a kid. That was, okay. what was that, mid-90s? I think 92 it was. 91, Early 90s. 90, 91, 91, November yeah, 7th. Yeah, so I was, 19, I was 12. November 7th, yeah, November 7th, 1991. And I'll tell you why I'll never forget the date was I spoke to Urban. I call him by his real name. On November 7th, 2011, when Smoke and Joe Frazier passed away. And I said, what are the odds that the two biggest robber in the history of sports were Ollie Frazier and Bird and Magic? And uh, Joe passes on the 20-year anniversary of your announcement. And uh, he loved Joe. Joe loved him. They had a very special relationship. Huh. Wow. God, these are just like, such iconic. Like, it sounds like a dream to hear you say this stuff. It's like so weird. I did, I, yeah, I, 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 I'll tell you, I did... Um, my boy, AK and Barack, I did a zone. I did a one-on-one sit down with them maybe about a year and a half ago. And it's not name dropping. I'm just in the middle of a conversation. You know, Evil Knievel, Muhammad Ali, and Pele, and all these different iconic figures we've been blessed to work with, some non-exclusively, some exclusively. Because do you ever stop and think for a minute the names that you just said? Because they're like, I was like, no, like we do it for a living. You really care more about the type of people that they are yeah. than the name. And uh, if any of them are really, really that difficult, I, I just couldn't have them in my life. I mean, you know, the most important thing to me is my spiritual sober journey coming up on 13 years sober. And um, I just, you know, I can't have the drama. It's got to be like life is like lasagna as often as possible. And I think if we could all keep life like lasagna, we're in the perfect place. <laughs> so, so yeah, I want to I want to talk about your journey. You have obviously your book, your story. I mean, in some ways it it's probably feels like the biggest most important work that you do is 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 on behalf of this it's an even bigger. It's bigger than any celebrity, which is the issue of addiction and you know, your sobriety, yeah. right? And how to yeah. really change the world with that. Um I want to I want to kind of close the loop on the magic thing though because I think it's so interesting. So he he made that announcement in ninety one. You said you were talking to him I think in ninety four. In ninety four, yep. So he was at that point like you're right. He was I mean there weren't movie theaters named after Magic Johnson in nineteen ninety four. He was he was an ex athlete that I think people felt bad for because of how he had to retire. But like he wasn't really fact. doing much yet right? no and jeff you got to remember too back then uh you know hiv was a death sentence people don't yeah. know the difference between hiv and aids and there was only three medications that were available you know thank god he was able to utilize all his doctor relationships and get what get what he needed and now i hear him speak all the time because we bought so many keynotes for him that it's easier to treat hiv than it is diabetes there's over 80 different medications out there huh wow that's stuff you haven't heard in a while. I've never heard. I mean, yeah. easier to treat HIV than diabetes. So it's no. not a death sentence anymore. No. Any more than being, yeah. Look, being, Char- being born Sheen. is a death sentence. But I mean, Charlie Sheen, I was with him a couple of weeks ago. He looks better than ever. He's doing great. Three and a half years sober. You know, the HIV, it's, it's kind of almost like not even detectable. I think it's just a, a, one of those situations where it might be dormant or whatnot, but they, they both live functioning, beautiful, healthy, incredible lives, you know? Huh. That's, oh, thank, thank heavens, man. That's such good news. Um, so cool. Yeah, I mean, so so I guess, again, just to kind of close the loop on the magic thing, because we'll just use that as, I think, an example. Of, so, I mean, like, wh- what was the strategy? We're like, hey, it's 1994, magic, you know, people. there's a lot of ignorance and even potentially some fear around your health situation. I mean, I remember people saying, yeah. like, he better not step back on the basketball court. I know. Like, we don't want to catch it. Yeah, like and, 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 and ironically, the one player that supported him was Dennis Rodman. So huh. they became close through the years because of that. It was nice that two of my guys, um, 
Dennis said, I'll just, I'll play him as hard as I would play him with or without the HIV because Carmelo and it's a bunch of guys that really were ignorant and made comments that, that, that really irked magic. I think Clyde Drexel was one of them and it's all forgiven now, but at that time it was just pure ignorance and yeah. not really understanding it. And, um, you know, sponsors pull away at that point, let's face yeah. it, you know, advertisers and, and uh, so it was an interesting time because um, I had to kind of navigate through that um, and, and understand the marketplace. But that bigger than life personality, when he stepped into a room, it always trumped everything because huh. people would just be like putty in his hands. And to this day, he's just got that gift. You know, he could meet you, you know, tomorrow and you guys could catch up for 15 minutes about life and bump into you two years from now in Las Vegas. I remember everything about your conversation that you had with him. Man, that is, that is the gift too, isn't it? I mean, if you could, yeah. if you could bottle one thing to serve people and say, here, this will help you be successful. It's yeah. probably that gift, right? I've, I've heard people talk about how Bill Clinton, Bill Clinton has that gift. Like, yep. like when you're talking yep. to him, you feel like you're the only person. You can be in a room of a thousand people and you feel like it's just you and him alone in that room. It's interesting. You, like, for example, the conversation, it, it seems like, you know, there's a lot of negative sort of antipathy and, and, and really ignorance around what these rich and famous people must be like. But, and, and, you know, I've been exposed to a few in my day, um, partly because I knew some, some money managers at one point who managed money for a lot of these really, really wealthy people. And some of them are almost like, I mean, this the force that they operate with in life, this, the gravitational energy that they have, like you said, the, their voice, their personality, they yeah. can be incredible human beings, get human beings yeah. that we would be much worse without. And I think if that, that's a message that needs to get out there, because I think that a lot of people are using negative celebrity energy and, and attention as a reason to, for, to validate a lot of really destructive attitudes around around money and success to say oh that's yeah. there's something wrong with that and it's not and, yeah. and, and harry and irvin are two great examples of that uh, they're incredible incredible human beings i mean like i said everybody is you know like carmen electra is like my sister we're, you know, she's so near and dear to me holly saunders that they're all of them chevy chase and his family um janie and the kids um you know rick flair and wendy his wife i mean i have it's just, you know, I don't even think about it anymore because they're all family. Roy Jones Jr., you know, Oscar De La Hoya is a new client. It, it's uh, everybody's got a special place in my life. Uh, and, and I get to know the real them. You know, Charlie Sheen and I talk, we laugh for 15 minutes, maybe a minute. It's about business, it's life. It's just, uh, you know, his ex wife, Denise Richards. I mean, they're, they're, you know, we work with her for years now. It's, um, it's just really special to, know the real them behind the camera behind the sports behind the interviews because everybody's just so quick to judge but they're human like anyone else they still got life problems and life challenges and kids that could be struggling or you know yeah. causing anxiety and you know celebrity kids aren't easy to raise when you grow up <laughs> in that limelight and they feel privileged or uh, that they can get away with anything so i know they've all had their issues from you know time to time would it be safe to say that the common denominator among all of those people, however talented or beautiful or whatever they may have been, is that they are incredibly hardworking people? Absolutely. It's, that's the one thing they all have. You know, Joe Montana worked with him for you know, 25 years. And I love how he says during his speeches, if you fail to prepare, prepare to fail. And that was Bill Walsh. And that's what he instilled in him. May he rest in peace, Dwight Clark, Jerry Rice, Ronnie Lott, those great 49ers teams. And I've heard so many messages from all of them. Larry Bird, who worked with for years, we were just with him two weeks ago. They all have that mindset. They all have that mindset. Evil can evil. Well, um, three weeks before he passed, he called me up and said to me, you know, Darren, I think the world of you, which, which meant everything to me because I wasn't in the right frame of mind at the time I was still using and he goes, you've worked so hard, and I'm, I'm so proud to call you my friend. He goes, one thing I want you to remember about me, I didn't know he was going to pass a few weeks later. He was like a real-life Superman. He thought he was never going to die. He goes, I have failed so many more times in my life than I'll ever succeed. 
I've fallen and crashed and burned on my bike way more times than any of the successful jumps. He goes, but this son of a bitch, I got back up every goddamn time, and that's how winning is done. And uh, coming from him, it's, it's the truth. You know, 47 broken bones in the Guinness Book of Records. So Joe <laughs> Frazier, um, you got to put in the word work. He would always say, if you cheat in the night of the dark, you're going to be found out under those bright lights. So he knew that when he had a train to fight Ali or any of his big championship fights, he would go up into the Catskill Mountains. He'd be up at four in the morning in the dead of the winter. I'd be like, why four? Like, I don't understand. He goes, because we do our five mile run and it was 10, 20 degrees below zero. And I love that cold air with combat boots and ankle weights on. I'm like, just the mindset. And he goes, because I knew the butterfly, which is what he called Muhammad, was doing the same goddamn thing. Yeah. And, um, he goes, the fight ain't won in the ring, Prince, just like in life. The fight's won in your preparation for that when the moment happens. And uh, so I, I, I just took all this from every one of them. It's just, uh, it was incredible over the years, and I'm still learning. You know, it's, it's crazy. I, I mentioned a little bit about my story, and I know, I know we both have, uh, have to go here in a, in a minute, so I'll just say this and, and um, we invite you to close. But, you know, I was telling you a little bit about my story when I was in my 20s, and I played piano in all of these, you know, really successful people's homes, a lot of billionaires, a lot of CEO, Fortune 500 CEOs. And um, because I was the piano player and I was this kid that they were inviting into their home to entertain their friends, I was able to build kind of, you know, reasonably sincere personal relationships with some of these guys, guys that, you know, every MBA student in the country would love to get two minutes of FaceTime with these guys. And I'm sitting right. there playing piano in their house going, well, so what's the secret? How'd you get successful? <laughs> and they're just, they're just talking to me going, well, you know, as long as you play my wife's favorite song, I'll tell you whatever you want to know. Right. And, yeah. uh, and it's funny because it's almost identical to what you just said. It was the same yep. thing, whether it was business or sports, it was what you're doing when nobody's watching and the lights are off and the discipline and the diligence. And I remember, um, I remember actually playing a suit, a party when the Super Bowl was in Houston that frankly, you probably booked because Joe Montana was one of the speakers. Uh, I, I was at, wait, wait a minute, it was in Houston. What year was that? I, 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 I did book er, one in Houston. Early 2000s. I booked him in Houston and I booked him once in Arizona. Yeah, it was um, him and Jerry Rice and who else was there? Chris Carter. And who's the old fullback? Um, uh, uh, was it? Not, I can't not, remember if it was. It wasn't Larry Zonka, but no, it was like no, Larry Zonka uh, like guy. What, what was he from the? What was he the fullback? Was it Roger Craig? No, it wasn't Roger Craig. I would have remembered that. It was older than that. Older than that. But well, anyway, I, I got to check. Yeah, you I probably check booked my, 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 Yeah, I got to check my. And I was the piano leaning. player, was and I was a piano player, and I got about five minutes of FaceTime with Jerry Rice. <laughs> Yep. And he, and he, he, cause he saw me warming up before the gig and he made a comment and he was like, you know, putting in the reps, putting in the reps. And I'm like, yeah, he goes, just, just like, and he said, made a comment about, it. he's like me playing scales was like him running routes. That's like amazing. he probably ran a route as many times as I played a C major scale, which was, you know, 20,000 times or something. And it was just and Jer- it's always the same yeah, story. man. Jer- and, and Jerry's an amazing individual. He's probably done just in the past year, three, four deals with him and him and his team. Uh, you know, it's, he still has that work ethic. It, it's it's yeah. unbelievable. I mean, amazing guy. Like I said, I just become a sponge. And then the amazing thing is now the way they look at me, the level of respect, it's not even as much about the making money as it is, but I've done my journey because they all know people that are suffering and they might be too close to the situation. They might not be able to help the family member, the friend. So they're actually coming to me. Wow. The, 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 the guy that was once uh, couldn't even count on himself to get out of bed in the morning and, and, and have a purposeful life. And now I've got this uh, incredible blessing of, you know, being able to help you know, so many, uh, no matter whether they're you know rich and famous or not. And I just love that because it, uh, it, 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 it shows me, how deep our personal relationships are because I could do a $10 million deal for match tomorrow. He's going to be pumped. We're going to high five each other. Patty, a boy. Now go out and find us another one. That's what he's going to say. But what I'm doing each and every day, it's, it, 
literally probably becomes more than half our conversations when we speak. Huh. That's powerful. Yeah. So the greatest, uh, sounds like the greatest work you do and the greatest work there is to be done is to put yourself in a position to be able to help other people. Be of service. I tell people we're not responsible for our thoughts, but you are responsible for how long you think those thoughts. And if you want to get out of your own head, help somebody else that's struggling and watch how quickly you get out of your own head. What a powerful statement. You're not responsible for your thoughts, but you are responsible for how long you think those thoughts. Yeah. I say we end on that note. That's hard. That hits. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Darren. Um, can, please and there was a me. reason, man. There was huh? a reason that this was, there was a reason that this had to be, this had to be rescheduled. We're realizing it now. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm at this point, I'm like, man, I need to redo all my interviews because they, <laughs> they get so good. Um, no, truly, thank you, man. Thank you for being back here. And thank you for just being who you are and, and doing what you do. Um, how can the world get more access to you? You know, social media, business, like what would you like to share? With yeah, you? so Instagram is at agent underscore DP, A-G-E-N-T underscore DP, official Darren Prince, D-A-R-R-E-N Prince is my uh my personal website prince marketing group is the business website and if like i said if anybody's sick suffering wants a copy of the book sent to them free of charge the publisher will ship out hard copies all they need to do is message me on instagram find me on facebook under darren prince and uh, we'll send it out and we're also um i'm also affiliated with banning treatment center i have a toll-free call center there 888 six darren d-a-r-r-e-n anybody needs treatment they can call that hotline they can't afford it we can scholarship you because i know certain people might not want to reach out to me but it's a you know completely confidential call to kind of see where you're at assess it and try to get the life that you deserve if you love entrepreneurship then you'll want to keep watching so click the next interview right here for some more millionaire secrets gold thanks for watching listen feel people just need to feel something. If you understand what somebody needs to feel, bingo, that's the target. So now your mission is to figure out how to get them to feel that way.